afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this webinar organized by the Center for Critical Thinking of Naples, Florida. My name is Ron Muchnick, and I am the Vice President of CCT. Let me mention at the outset uh, the ground, some of the ground rules before we begin. First of all, this session is being recorded and will be available soon on the CCT YouTube channel. Dr. Kupchella and I will not be able to see or hear you, but we invite and welcome your questions and comments via the Q and A feature, which is the last one to the right at the bottom of your screen. Please don't use the chat function. I apologize in advance if we can't get to all of the questions and comments. We have a large audience today, uh, which of course is a very good thing. Uh, I'm particularly delighted to introduce my fellow CCT board member and fellow Pennsylvanian, Dr. Charles Kupchella, today's speaker. Dr. K has served as the president of the University of North Dakota. He is past president of both the American Association for Cancer Education and the Kentucky Academy of Science. He holds a PhD in biology from St. Bonaventure University and an undergraduate degree from Indiana University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Kay is the author of more than 50 5.0 published articles in medical and other scientific periodicals. He's also the author of six books on cancer, the special senses, and the environment and other aspects of human biology. His most recent books are The Tree Shack, a story about the foundations of morality and the origins of humankind, which was published in 2014. And the second one was the morality, how it, morality, how it evolved and how it was hijacked and confounded by religion. And that was published in 2019. As you may be able to tell from the two most recent book titles and his overall background, Dr. Kupchella is an inveterate critical thinker. You're in for a treat today. Chuck, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ron. Hope all of you can see the screen. And while uh, I'm having you assure yourself to that, I'm going to give you a quiz. First thing off the bat, I know we have lots of critical thinkers on the program today. So here's a short quiz. We're going to actually hold the answer to this quiz until the end. You walk out of your tent five miles due south. You then walk um, uh, the same distance due east. You turn and walk the same distance due north. And you find yourself back at your tent. There's a bear in your tent. What color is the bear? So some of you may have heard that one before, but if not, um, you've heard it now and we'll look forward to the answer to the end, but I expect most of you will get that easily. <clears throat> As Ron said, we are associated with the Center for Critical Thinking. Uh, we are an interactive discussion group. I'm going to keep my remarks to about 45 minutes here this afternoon and leave um, considerable time beyond that for Q&A, comments, rebuttal, uh, however you want to have your uh, input. This is a graphic rep representation of the human brain. With 100 billion neurons and some 100 trillion connections, it's said to be the most complicated structure in the universe. Not all brains function in the same way. Before birth even, things can go wrong with them, and certainly late in life, things can go wrong with them. That's not what this presentation is about, however. Brains come with hardware and some software, but mostly they have to be programmed in order to function, to do critical thinking. From early childhood through adulthood, even the hardware has to be fully developed and established and isn't completed until ages 25 or so. 
We must be educated through parenting, through school, formal education, and learning through life's hard knocks. Learning is said to continue throughout life, uh, but failure to be open to this and such things as willful, willful ignorance and deliberately closed mindedness and the application of misinformation uh, as, will, as well as willful use of mis misinformation known to be misinformation to mislead others is what this presentation is about. So it's not only about not wanting to or having been programmed to think critically, it's about folks who don't want other people thinking critically either. And it's about uh, those who would influence others through misinformation. I thought this was a really interesting uh, graphic, New York Daily News, a new horseman of the apocalypse, misinformation. So it's not only, as I said, about people not wanting other people to think. It's about not wanting to respect what people thought even in the past. And it's about now misinformation. So my book, the one on morality, uh, is really part of the basis for this uh, uh, presentation. It's, it's really a, a part of what I would call human biology and how we got to be who we are. A uh, little disclaimer, I have uh, had the good fortune to work with both Democrats and Republicans throughout my life. I've even voted for both Democrats and Republicans on occasion. I have a brother who's going to be very unhappy to hear that news, but it's true. Um, it's what's happened to politics since these days that has concerned me and I'm sure uh, many of you. So this is about hostility toward or mistrust of intellectuals and intellectual pursuits. I've been watching it. I've been seeing it happen. And it's attacks on the merits of science and on education and uh, or literature as ways of getting at the truth. It's the tendency of government, ours in particular, to formulate policies without consulting authoritative studies of problems or noting them, simply disregarding them. So in a word, or two, or three, or four, anti-intellectualism is a no-brainer. Don't use mine. I don't want you to use yours. And even if you do, we don't care what you found out. Well, back at the very beginning, from the Dark Ages through the Enlightenment, I'm going to trace this, uh, this uh, ideal of, of thinking critically and of rational thinking. Primitive beliefs, of course, were just that, very, very primitive. They thought people back then thought the world was flat, excuse the expression, they didn't know squat back then. They had to guess for the reasons for why the things they saw in their environment were happening. The earth appeared flat, it rumbled sometimes, so gosh, we must be flat and carried on the backs of some animals. After a long stretch, a couple of hundred thousand years, maybe that long, we finally get to the ancient Greeks about 3,000 years ago, who began to use rational thought and um, logic as a way to arrive at their conclusions, rather than just assuming, well, if something bad happened, it was a demon. Um, it was kind of the beginning of the end of people banging on pots and pans to make the evil spirit quit eating the moon during an eclipse, that sort of thing. Unfortunately, though, after the Greek uh, era, early Greek era, we went into a period of about a thousand years where not much intellectual happened. Uh, reason was given over to, as it turns out, a, a very authoritative, uh, stifling, authoritative Roman church during most of that period of time. That's where all the education was. That's where all the, the rules, the uh, the, the facts that were accepted as facts were defined as such during that long period. It lasted almost a thousand years. Then toward the end, we had the Italian Renaissance, 1300s and 1400s, where at least in the arts and in music, uh, things began to come a little lively. Um, a little bit later, the 16th century, Martin Luther kind of broke the mold and said, look, there's some stuff that's been going on for the last couple of hundred years that just ain't right. 
And so he broke away, was excommunicated, and kind of started this revolt of, against authority that questioned things like it became fully blown during what's called the 18th century enlightenment. It was here when people began to say things like, what do you mean the divine right of a king to hold power? This is where the ideal of consent of the government, the government came into to being. It's where um, science became the trigger for the idea that, you know what, we can actually figure things out. And once we started to figure things out using science, like the laws of motion, et cetera, uh, that then people thought, well, maybe we could figure everything out ultimately. And it started that role. Here are some of the scientists and philosophers, actually most of the activists in those days were both scientists and philosophers. And I'm pleased and proud that two of these people are ours, Jefferson and Franklin. Um, they're often listed and rightfully so as leaders of that enlightenment in the 1800s. And those folks brought back what really was their return to classical antiquity when the idea became and was approached one more time the human mind is the way we arrive at the truth. And then it can be used for the rational and virtuous ordering of human affairs. That's something that Plato said. Our founding fathers were actually science guys. You know the story about uh, Ben Franklin and the kite showing that electricity wasn't a thunderbolt thrown by Thor, but was actually a form of electricity that we went on from there to do lots of wonderful things with electricity. Any of you that have been through Monticello know Thomas Jefferson was an inventor. He had probably 12 or 13 things he invented. Tinkerer uh, was not a professional science, scientist, of course, but science oriented. I can figure this out and I'm going to find a way to solve this problem. Um, one, of, one of the leaders, our third uh, president. Uh, Rene Descartes kind of expressed the essence of the Enlightenment in this way, which some people thought it was kind of harsh, but I want you to reflect on these words here. Nothing that cannot be recognized by intellect or reason can legitimately be classified as knowledge. Reason alone determines knowledge. The rational pursuit of truth could start with doubt about every belief and every unsubstantiated assertion. Lots of people thought that was kind of harsh. So it led to romanticism where there was more of an emphasis on imagination and dreaming and it should be okay to do that and we shouldn't be bound by having to prove everything. Modernism was another step in that direction and then we got to this thing called postmodernism eventually in which uh, was a period in, in the middle late 1900s where people were skeptical of things that were described as facts. Subjectivism became kind of the order of the day. Relativism Suspicion of reason kind of came back. Postmodernists took the position that truth is contingent on historical and social context rather than being absolute and universal. Uh, so today, of course, we're seeing lots of evidence in our society here in the United States, a leading nation in terms of education. And yet uh, we have lots of what I would call, this is kind of a constellation of things, ignorance, indifference, aggressive ignorance where I don't want to hear about it, I don't want to think about it, and aggressive use of misinformation. Here are some examples. 20% of Americans, according to polls, and I can provide sources of these if anybody would like to have them. They're all NBC, Pew Research, that uh, CBS polls, that sort of thing. 20% of us, one out of five, still believe the Earth is the center of the universe. 400 years after uh, Galileo uh, showed that that it was not the case. 25%, one in four, believe that uh, evolution is some kind of a biological construct that has no basis uh, in, in reality. Don't accept evolution. Fluoridation, many of you will remember, as I do as a kid in the 1950s, when this controversy raged. And you know, there's, there are some scientific issues surrounding the use of fluoride in drinking water. Uh, there, there is an overuse of fluoride that can cause things called fluorosis, et cetera. But I remember it vividly as this was described, using fluoridation was people walking around with posters claiming this was a communist plot. Uh, he was putting fluoride in our drinking water and it was gonna either kill us or make us all stupid. 
that the communists were behind it. And it was kind of my first introduction to what I would call uh, the, the in the inclination to go with the conspiracy theory when I found something I didn't like or couldn't understand. They must be against me. Somebody's, somebody's working against my best interest. And so for me, that was kind of the beginning of conspiracies. 60% people believe that uh, uh, creationism should be taught in science classes in school, telling me they don't really appreciate what science really is. 75% believe there's evidence for extraterrestrials or a government cover-up. 50% uh, in full believe in baseless conspiracies today of some kind, including about one third of Americans who are open at least to a QAnon uh, conspiracy theory today. 25% of our fellows believe in reincarnation and witches. Another quarter believe in astrology. 7% believe Elvis lives and that the moon landing never really happened. It's a big lie that we landed on the moon. 60% of Americans believe Noah's Ark is actually a true story. And while I don't mean to uh, criticize anyone who does hold this belief out of a, out of a, a deep-seated belief that everything in the Bible is literally true, I once had a conversation with a relative about this, just wanting to have a discussion one day, something we, those of us who are critical thinkers like to do, just some verbal sparring. And I said, you know, this couldn't really have happened because the water would have had to be five miles deep, uh, Sam, when it's over the city of New Orleans in order to cover Mount Everest, five miles deep. You tell me you believe in a deity that's all omniscient. He knew where all the bad guys were. Why would he kill all the puppies and the good people, women, children, uh, little cats, little dogs? Um, why didn't the, how did the water going up that deep cause the marine mammals to be killed since they would have loved it. They thought they had died and gone to a proverbial heaven. <clears throat> and after I listed two or three more of those, my, uh, the other person to whom I was <laughs> railing said, well, I don't, I never thought about any of that, and I don't want to think about it now. 60% of Americans believe some vaccines cause autism. And as far as I know, and I've looked, there's no evidence for this. It started with a, a bogus report uh, that was since retracted, and yet 60% of our fellow Americans believe it's still true. 50% of Americans believe genetically modified foods are harmful. And this is from a Pew Research study. And of course, there are lots of ways to genetically modify foods, one of which is simply to select the most uh, beautiful tomatoes and plant seeds only from those. It's something we've been doing as humans probably from the beginning of our time as homo sapiens. So it's led to the real reality that none of the food we eat has not been genetically modified. But Again, people I talk with about this say, I don't want to think about it. Global warming, one out of five Americans say it's not happening. Uh, and we are supposedly, according to this individual, John Fugel saying, Americans lead the world in the number of people who believe the science, climate science is fake, but pro wrestling is real. Uh, just for fun, I mean, more people were able to name two of the seven dwarfs than were able to name any two members of the Supreme Court. And it shows another kind of the lack of just being unconnected, uh, indifferent, uh, not tuned in to what's going on. 10% uh, of college graduates in one study said they thought Judy, uh, Judge Judy was a member of the Supreme Court. 10% college grad. There's some part of the Quran, they tell me, uh, I know they quibble about whether it really says that or not, but it says that if you get 72 dark-eyed virgins all to yourself in paradise if you blow yourself up and, and die as a martyr. Uh, women, by the way, uh, only get one uh, somebody, and they're supposed to be happy with whomever that is. Here's a uh, picture that I thought was just fascinating. Two individuals you'd think would know full well the nature of the actual Holocaust. And here they're comparing it to a vaccine, a vaccine. I've, I've watched this happen in the last couple of years. Many of you have too. Drives me absolutely crazy because I know these, these vaccines right here, the ones that are listed here, 
uh, probably changed every one of our lives. Uh, it, it probably, if had had not been for this, probably a good fraction of those on this on this program today wouldn't be here because an ancestor that gave rise to you would have been dead. Maybe you yourself. Uh, and yet, somehow we we have uh, people looking at things and not seeing what's actually there. This is. Uh, this picture was to remind me that after years of watching television programs, St. Elsewhere, MASH, Grey's Anatomy, Scrubs, Chicago Hope, all these programs with doctors and nurses uh, with masks on, somebody was able to persuade, I don't know, 50 some million of us that masks really don't work. And that's why we shouldn't uh, mandate them. They don't really work. And why, why I would ask it with all these, well, you get the idea. Today we have government interfering with school curriculum in ways that I've never seen in, my, in the first many years of my life. Today we're telling teachers what they can teach in the history courses. Uh, we have states where they've tried to rule on inserting creationism into the science curriculum. We've had uh, books like uh, this, mouse that has been banned um, and cannot be shown in schools with government uh, laws that prohibiting the same thing. Uh, and books are being banned every day. And I'm, I'm hoping that my books get banned. Uh, I have one coming out called um, uh, Our First Civil War, which is a, a, a cautionary tale about the possibility of an, another one. I hope that one gets banned because then it would become a, a raging bestseller according to the pattern that we've seen. So we're banning books, but we're still not doing anything about guns, even though never, no kid has ever been killed by a book. We have teachers that are being forbidden to tell the truth about what happened here in this country years ago, because as I understand it, and I've tried hard to, why would, why would you want to deny people the opportunity to know about our true history. And the only explanation I could get is it makes somebody feel bad. We don't wanna be having teachers do things that make people feel bad. So here, the first uh, black PhD ever granted at Harvard, W.E.B. Du Bois uh, said, either the United States destroy ignorance or ignorance will destroy the United States. We've been warned before by people going way back. Uh, and this is, so it's not something that what I'm seeing now and what I'm warning about today, we've been warned about uh, quite a bit. Why? Why this anti-science, anti-intellectualism, anger at people who are educated, uh, a willingness to deny uh, the, the access to certain uh, information, uh, in a country where we're supposed to be free. Uh, why? Well, I have a, some, a theory and it actually it has 12 parts. And what it, because like most problems, you know, there are lots of, even ones that look inexplicable. There are sometimes explanations for why this has happened. And, and some of them are actually not illegitimate uh, reasons. Um, number one, ignorance about how science works. Uh, you, you've all heard about how angry, and maybe you're, some of you are among those, you've been angered by the changing uh, recommendations made by the CDC or the NIH. Uh, I know that science actually works that way. Uh, it moves according to new discoveries, and you disre you, you you modify what you had as a working truth by bringing into it what's now new information. And it drives human beings who aren't into this kind of crazy because just tell me what to do. Don't, don't, be, don't be messing with me. I wanna know what to do. So I don't like this being jerked around. Snobbery and elitism is actually a reason, I think in part. And I would just say that from my own experience, I know many of my colleagues refused to ever try to explain what they do to, to lay people because they thought they would say things like, well, they, they just wouldn't understand, so I'm not gonna bother. And you know, if you look down your nose at somebody long enough, they're gonna punch you in it uh, pretty soon. So there's a little bit of that element. It's a big part of the political divide. 
today. Um, here's, a, here's a gee whiz fact. The majority of people in both parties, Republicans and Democrats, uh, viewed colleges and universities as a positive factor in American life as recently as 2015. Along came 2016, and now only 43% of Republicans think in a poll responded that they thought colleges, universities were positive forces for America. Democrats, it's still 72%. And it was dramatic. The way the polls showed this was Democrats, it's stayed right through that era all the way to today, about 70, 67%. There are some who thought it was a negative. Um, I uh, expect that um, this probably had to do with, uh, you know, to, what was in the curriculum uh, that maybe uh, evangelicals didn't like of both parties. But 2016, all of a sudden, the bottom drops out. Now only about a third of Republicans think uh, colleges uh, have a positive uh, effect on American life. An undereducated populace in the face of increasing world competition in technical areas. People see science as having taken jobs away and they don't like it. Um, American 15 year old kids rank 24th in a math skills test out of 29 advanced countries, speaking, I guess, to the quality of the education we get in our schools and the fact that we need more work. And that's a deep problem because back to what parents do to encourage kids and help them in school, all of that. Um, social media, number five, and truth as a free for all. And you all know, as I do, that you could go on the internet and find any particular answer to any particular question you want. And while the promise of the internet was free information, it actually flooded the zone with such garbage that you can't find out the truth by going to the internet unless you do a lot of work to roll out, sort the garbage from what's real and looking for authoritative sources and the more you distrust authoritative sources, of course, the more difficult that will be. Few of us have time to do our own research, to, to actually come up with our own conclusions about what is and what isn't true. So as a result of that, there's been a demise of newspapers and magazines. Fake news or bad news is more engaging. Analytical reports and thought pieces, not so much. And I think we're all being gamed by the likes of Fox News and MSNBC people being drawn to these sources um, because they want reinforcement of what they already believe rather than looking for uh, answers to real questions that affect their daily lives. And then of course, talk show hosts who, uh, whose job it is to stir up audiences and keep them in the ratings. <clears throat> it's powerlessness in the face of incomprehensible pace of change today. Now, this happens, I see this very close to home here. Here's one maybe you've seen. Uh, geez, Grandma, it's not that hard. Go into settings, select Wi-Fi, select it, tap it with your finger. Oh, my God. We see this kind of thing every day. We're just not able to keep up, and we don't like it. It's too great a distance between what science can reach and what we can possibly care about because of the daily toll we, that our, our lives take on us just trying to make a living and get by. Um, here's an example. This is in, in about four miles from my hometown in Pennsylvania. <clears throat> I don't know whether, Ron, you have this in your part of the state, but boy, my part is full of this. These streams have a pH of about the equivalence of battery acid. The mines that, from the, which these streams of acid come were actually operational 100 years ago. Back then, there were no regulations uh, about where the mine uh, spoil went. These were, some of this comes from spoil banks. Some of it comes right out of the mines, water running through them. Um, so 100 years later, um, we, I can just see, since I grew up there 100 years ago, 79 years ago, that uh, somebody's saying, well, look, maybe we shouldn't be doing this mining here because somebody's gonna to have to put up with this 100 years from now or 79 years from now. They wouldn't have cared one whit and say, well, we'll have to solve that problem then. I have to make a living now. Science sometimes gets it wrong. And I mean really wrong. This was uh, an episode back in the 50s where women taking thalidomide, a drug 
they thought was going to help ease um, some of the some of the uh, symptoms of uh, pregnancy, some of the downside of being pregnant, and then led to all the birth defects, hundreds of thousands of babies all over the world. Um, so, you know, you, you, science um, blew that one. Um, in fact, by the way, thalidomide's still around. We use it for certain kinds of cancer. It, it actually is effective as a drug uh, today. You just don't ever let a pregnant woman come into contact with it because it's a teratogen. teratogen. It will change, it will affect the development of limb buds in this case. Uh, number 10, scientists are a threat. Scientists gave us the atom bomb. Some of them who developed the atom bomb felt guilty about it till their dying day. Uh, we still see these pictures of mad scientists and cringe sometimes of what they might be capable of doing uh, in areas like um, bioterrorism, where deliberately scientists at work creating uh, weapons of uh, bioterroristic uh, weapons. Number 11, science and scientists for sale. I see this criticism a, a lot and I've experienced it some, working with colleagues in the, uh, in the tobacco industry, for example, who were actually science, trained scientists. And of course, what they would do uh, based on where, where they were paid back then is they would argue that you can't prove that tobacco causes cancer because you can't really do an experiment where you decide who gets to smoke and who doesn't. And as long as you can't do that experiment, it might just be some third thing that causes both cancer of the lung and your, your tendency to become addicted to tobacco. So it's this third thing that's responsible for, for uh, cancer, not tobacco, uh, stuff like that. So, you know, a half truth is no better than a lie. Um, uh, as illustrated in this uh, picture right here. So number 12, political ideology and religious dogma are easier, more comfortable than having to work to find the truth on your own. Just tell me, just tell me, because it's hard to deal with statistical probabilities or such things as, well, on the other hand, which scientists uh, are uh, often prone to do. Thinking and critical thinking is hard sometimes. It hurts your head to think about certain things. I know it's hurt mine. This was, this was a sculptor who thought he would do this, uh, represent this uh, graphically, as you can see in this picture right here. And it's always been true. I'm sure it always will likely be true that simple but wrong simply has way more appeal than complicated but right. H.L. Mencken in the early part of the 20th century, it's back when I was born, said the most common of all follies is to believe passionately in the palpably untrue. The majority of men, and he would have said women if he were saying this today, prefer delusion to truth. It soothes, it's easy to grasp. Above all, it fits more snugly than truth into a universe of complicated and irrational phenomena defectively grasped. I thought that was just a very succinct way of stating number 12. So science, you know, we, we take the position that I would rather have questions that can't be answered than answers that can't be questioned. And there is the rub between critical thinking, rational thinking, and the use of things like political ideology and religious dogma, because there's where you have answers that can't be questioned. This explains for me things like the inability of people who take this position that I have these answers and I don't want to think about any other alternative or I don't want to question them. Uh, it's where the origins of such things as the inability to compromise comes from. And here I think is a, is a grand illustration of this. Uh, this is Joyce Meyer, who's one of the mega millionaires, uh, preachers who invented this thing called prosperity gospel, where it used to be that Jesus came to the world to help the poor, and now he wants us to be rich. So we have her and, and a whole constellation of others who um, are, have taken, up, taken that up. 
uh, you, you're confused, tell people to stop trying to figure everything out. If they do that, they'll stop being confused. And by the way, she got this directly from the Lord. I asked him and he told me, tell them to stop trying to figure things out. So she found it true in her own experience that reasoning and confusion go together. So here, ladies and gentlemen, is a convergence of um, religion into this issue and the thing called uh, dogma. And I conflated it with political ideology because that's kind of what happened in one of our two uh, main political parties and here in the United States. We blend uh, dogma and, and uh, ideology. And now we have a, a, an un, immutable, uh, unchangeable, we're gonna lock on uh, and not bother to think anymore about. Uh, and you know, the, um, why religion is a great comfort to lots of people. And I think that's just terrific, it's, it's wonderful. But I, I don't see how you can go there to find the truth about things that are not really in religion's domain. But of course, now that it's conflated with politics, it, it's kind of confusing where the edge of all that is. But, you know, where's the ball? If 4,000, there are 4,000 religious traditions in the world, you can look that up. Uh, and there are about five different sources that give a number about like that in the, uh, in, on the internet and elsewhere. <clears throat> including some uh, religious sources that will say, yeah, there are about 4,000 different religious tr traditions in the world. They can't all be right. Although most of them claim absolutism as one of their, um, one of their uh, bedrock parts of uh, dogma. We have the truth and it's immutable. I've had discussions with colleagues sometimes and they say, uh, they say, Ron, do you, do you believe the Bible is absolutely inerrant and is, is absolutely literally true, not just sort of true, but literally true? And Ron would say, yes, I do. And I would say, well, do you know that you are supposed to kill people if they don't, if they work on Sunday? Maybe they don't because they're, not, they're confused about whether that's Saturday or Sunday, but <clears throat> if you work on that day, you're supposed to be put to death according to Exodus chapter 31 verse 15. In Leviticus, he that blasphemes in the name of the Lord shall be put to death and all the congregations shall stone him. You still believe this literally? Maybe they were just, this was a tradition that might have been okay. I don't know how it would be, but back then, but isn't anymore. We certainly don't see this being acted on every uh, Sunday, go rounding up people and stoning them because they missed church or blasphemed. So the exhortation is be a free thinker and don't accept everything you hear as truth. Be critical and evaluate what you believe in. And I would say everything, even what I'm saying right here today, you should uh, be critical and evaluate and take away what you wish and reject the rest. I'm gonna close with, uh, the consequences of anti-intellectualism and anti-science attitudes. And maybe this graphic is just a little over the edge. Uh, maybe it won't quite be, uh, this might not be uh, an accurate depiction of the consequence, but it's not gonna be good. In fact, this story, this presentation, I'm sad to say does not have a happy ending. Uh, consequences, you have people who don't know very much making fun of people who know a lot. I've seen evidence of that. I've seen examples of it. I've watched it for the last two or three years with great dismay. Uh, I see people starting to follow rather than issues. I see them following cult-like uh, personalities rather than uh, issues. I've seen this um, complete upending of the, the uh, the uh, ideal of Christianity uh, by the mega millionaires. And of course, trying to reconcile the party, in, in this case, uh, one of our two political parties, uh, family values with people at rallies who have shirts like you see here. Uh, we have a Republican National Committee who just came, went on record as saying this, which we all saw and which they saw too. So this is an example for me of People who know they're using misinformation when they say this was legitimate political discourse, because you can't look at this 
<laughs> you cannot know this and describe it as political discourse unless you believe, which many do, and in fact, there's some evidence for it, that if you, if you tell a lie often enough, people begin to believe it, even against what they saw with their own eyes. Another person called this, well, just the same as, it looked like a bunch of tourists visiting our nation's capital. Can you believe it? That actually happened. So intelligence has become a political liability, as I see it. Uh, Jacoby said, used that uh, phrase in his book, The Age of American Unreason, which he's, he's defined as this age we're in. But as I say, this has been going on a long time. So we don't get people who are thinkers and critical thinkers. We get people like you see depicted here in Congress. And as I said before, anti-intellectual has been a constant thread winding its way through our political cultural life. People who banging on the table saying, my ignorance is just as good as what you know. And maybe sometimes it is, but mm -hmm, it ought to be pretty rare when that happens. This was an interview with Dr. Francis Collins, who was the director of the National Institute of Health, Institutes of Health, and he's just retiring after 13 years. And the, and the interviewer says, what was your darkest hour during those 13 years? And he said, 50 million Americans refusing a life-saving, safe, effective vaccine, not only that would benefit them, but their fellow Americans because of its, uh, its inclination or its uh, resulting uh, more likelihood of variants popping out of a population that's unvaccinated. He said there were an estimated 100,000 Americans who died because of misinformation. And he said, it doesn't get any darker than that. The COVID death rate in America in December of last, this past December, just before I came, we came back down here to Florida, is equivalent to a fully loaded 737 crashing every hour with no survivors. It was equivalent to a 9-11 disaster every day. In fact, today, I mean, still, even, with, even though we've seen a great drop in cases, there are 2,000 deaths every day. Almost all of them, people who were not vaccinated because of, in many cases, misinformation. And the reason this concerns me, and the reason I'm railing about this so much, is that there will be other, um, there will be other uh, pandemics that come along maybe even derived from the one we're in now. But it's gonna be our, as population gets more and more dense, um, we're, we're gonna see more of these and have to deal with them. It's led to the politicization of science. Um, the last administration came in and, and, and re rescinded about 100 different environmental regulations uh, based on a, a, a bill that was passed at the time that said, you can't start, you can't have a new regulation until you get rid of two, two others. So it was an anti-regulation. All of, And there may have been some that were overstepping or overreach, but certainly not all 100. So we have this, what some have described as a war on science because it gets in the way of, you know, doing the business sometimes. We gotta let people get oil. We, we're gonna have high gas prices, God forbid, we have gas prices like they've been having in Europe for the last 50 years. Um, we don't want to see that happen in America, so we're going to just let her rip. Here's one from uh, Ulysses S. Grant that I ran across in doing the research I did on that book on the Civil War. Hey, think about this. This is the guy who won the Civil War, and he's reflecting on, could we have another one in the future? And he says, this was in... Well, the date there, 1875, at a meeting. I predict that the dividing line will not be Mason and Dixon, but between patriotism and intelligence on one side, superstition, ambition, and ignorance on the other. What about historical impacts of science and education? Well, I'm not going to dwell on this. I think these are, these are all great truths. And I think everybody knows this in their heart of hearts. A strong economy begins with a strong, well-educated workforce. Education has always been and always will be a great idea. Knowledge is always gonna be better than ignorance. 
uh, the, the history of the impact sciences have is incontrovertible. I mean, here it is. Most of the inventions, that are, and, and we're on a steep descent right as, we, as I speak, uh, new technology coming every day faster and faster. This is a, a graph showing lifespan. Almost all of this is a result of science and the support for science in this country, which had been a model up until recently. And gosh, I know this as a, as a beneficiary. I worked in what was really the golden age of science. It makes me so sad to see it now being dis disrespected and uh, actually uh, maligned by, by our leaders. This is world population. This is not just the US. Our population language down here for world population and then because of all these things like the green revolution and modern medicine, we now have 7.8 billion of us. And of course that's another issue we're at a point in our history where we're facing what some of my colleagues call an existential issue. And we appear to be, appear to be unable to deal with this in any, effect, in any kind of an effective way because we either deny that it's happening or we believe that we can't do anything about it anyway. And, it, and the world will never cooperate to carry this off because there is such a different playing field for all of them. And so, Here's a result of climate change. These fires in California, I watched them. You have, they've been on the news. I don't know, it seems like every few months is it is a new place that's either in Colorado or California burning. Wildfires will worsen a UN report. That was in yesterday's Naples Daily News. Uh, here's uh, flooding, either coastal flooding because of sea rise, greater uh, frequency and severity of storms. Um, we're going to see a lot more of this. This was predicted. I, I know my first uh, memory of, of reading about this going to be happening <clears throat> was probably 40 years ago, and we should have been doing something about it then. And we're not even, we're not, we're still not doing anything about it now. So there's water in some places, other places are going dry. That means people who used to live on this land are now becoming immigrants, migrants, immigrants. They're leaving they have to, where they have to. You would if your family had nothing to eat. So it's an irony that some of the conservative, extreme right conservatives who say, I don't want to do anything about climate change. They also don't want to see immigrants uh, moving around. But they're related. And it's one of those things you don't see unless you examine an issue like this critically. Bottom line, humankind cannot afford to live in the moment and fail anymore to consider the long-term future. And yet I'm sad to say it appears there'd be little indication we can behave in any other way. I mean, here's, here's the news this morning. We're still thinking we have people, groups of people kill one another and this is how we'll, I don't know what, uh, make things better for somebody. Further reading or recommend that, I would recommend this book by uh, Otto. Uh, on, it's called The War on Science. This is my book on uh, the tree shack, it's called. Uh, it gets into this topic about the future. It actually describes a, a, it's a science fiction work about a civilization far away that comes here and tries to help us after their civilization had collapsed uh, three different times at least. Uh, and they came, they finally fixed it and they came here to help us avoid what they went through. That's what this book is about. And then here's another one, uh, Susan Jacoby, The Age of American Unreason. If you would like to uh, take this issue up with me on the internet, this is an email address you may use. You can also get to me through that email address right there. And I'm going to now turn it back over to Ron and stop sharing my screen. Thank you all very much for your attention. I'm gonna uh, take a moment to get my uh, screen back in shape here, get off of full screen and uh, bring up some stuff. Uh, uh, Chuck, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation and uh, of course, many important observations uh, to go with it.
Um, let me uh, let me share with you some of the questions that uh, people have asked. Um, one person asked, "What specifically do you think led to so many Republicans changing their minds in that graphic that you showed about colleges and universities in 2016? Did uh, President Trump say specific things to them to affect this uh, that he the questioner doesn't recall?" Well, you know, it's it's one of those things I just don't know. I've watched it happen. I think it had to do with the uh, the convergence to you know back during the Reagan, administ Reagan administration, we had this thing called the moral majority that kind of cropped up and became a very influential part of uh, um, the the Republican Party uh, because it was a it was a uh, one of the <clears throat> What would they be? Well, one point of the elements in the coalition, okay, and they had they began to take on more and more power in that coalition. And there's been a running battle, of course, over the years between fundamentalism and science, fundamentalism and education. Lots of fundamentalists believe you go to college to lose your faith. In fact, I, I had classmates who had that advice from their parents when they were going off to college, you're gonna lose your faith because you're going to school and they're gonna, those teachers are all liberals and they're going to uh, make you lose your religion when you go. So we're sad to see you go, but we know you have to. So I think that influence was a big part of it, Ron. I mean, there surely were some other others perhaps, but I think it's the combination of the observation that many faculty members, the majority of faculty do tend to be more liberal and the, uh, the, the alliance between uh, uh, evangelical religion and the part Republican Party, those two things. Um, another person uh, uh, asked the question, uh, and I'm not familiar with this group, but what can groups like the Society of Sigma Psi do better? Are the Scientific you... Research Society. Um, well, uh, I think they need to they be more active in doing what I'm doing, calling these things out. Um, may, maybe uh, take on more responsibility for having scientists become better communicators of what they do. Uh, become, well, excuse the expression, and I hate to say it, become a little more political in selling the science enterprise as a positive beneficial thing for our country. Uh, we could do better. Uh, in, in that, I know we can. So those things at least, um, I used to be, uh, at one time was a member of uh, Sigma Xi and they did talk about this issue, but since those years, I haven't seen much action uh, doing anything about it really. Um, I, <clears throat> I, I uh, both Sigma Xi and an organization I would call the uh, American Association of University Professors. It used to be a, the spokesperson in higher ed or the force for um, what's called uh, academic freedom. You know, this, this movement uh, to, re, to restrict what teachers can teach. Uh, this, the fact that in some uh, religious colleges and universities, which are supposed to be teaching critical thinking, Make, fa make faculty in some cases, not all of them do this, sign a uh, pledge that they're, they hold all these things as beliefs and they're, they're unmutable. You must believe these things to teach there. Uh, that, that would, in, back in the day, would have caused a, uh, well, an academic stink to be raised about how can you, how can you learn critical thinking from people who are bound to dogma and can't, I'm not allowed to think about particular issues. Didn't, so, that, um, didn't that come up in the, uh, in the uh, most recent, in the Barrett uh, uh, Supreme Court justice hearing, uh, that she had, she had signed a, a letter of some kind about one issue. I don't think it was a lot of issues. It must have been the abortion issue. Yeah. And we've talked, as we've gone into this uh, administration, of course, there were a lot of uh, demands that uh, Joe Biden be refused communion because he, while well, he may not he may not believe in, in uh, abortion uh, himself, he was going to be liberal about letting other people do what they thought was right for themselves. 
So it's it's that edge between <laughs> uh, live, let live, but not only do I hold my dogma to be irrefutable and absolutely un immutable, but I want everybody else to believe it too. <laughs> it's uh, It's been going on for centuries and I'm sure we'll continue for at least a little while, although maybe there's some hope that uh, that will uh, it will continue to lessen in, in uh, severity. Uh, one of the people whose questions I shared also had a comment uh, which links with somebody else's question. And that was, uh, I, she was very concerned and upset that we have well-educated senators and governors who are encouraging the anti-intellectual war on science. Um, and another person asked, uh, and I think you partially answered this, but you might want to take another shot at it. Uh, do you have any hope for the future? Who um, you, you always have to have some hope. I'm not encouraged though. I don't have, I don't feel encouraged that it's going to get better anytime soon. I actually believe it's going to, it's going to, it's going to, take some form of collapsing before the pieces can be picked up and put back together. Because I see movement that, that it leads to greater and greater division. We're starting from a big divide right now. It's been widening for a long time. And all indications are it's going to continue to get even wider. So as long as these so-called senators who have to spend too much of their time raising money and are beholden not only to the people who sponsor them, but obviously to their bases. And they're pandering to their bases and to these people who, from whom they get the money they need to stay in office every day. So they're, 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 they're hamstrung by that. Um, and, and to me, that's where the explanation is. You can't, um, you have to turn people loose to be critical thinkers. I think that's what Thomas Jefferson and some of the founders had in mind when they meant we're, we're going to take some time off from the farm, go to Washington and serve for a while, and then get back on the farm. Let somebody else do it. So we need term limits. We need a, a, re, a revision in our system of financing campaigns. So I don't know how many, I saw the figure one time and I was aghast, how many hours every day senators and their staffs have to work at raising money uh, and not doing the business we think they're there to do. Well, that sounds like uh, somebody asked about uh, where do we start to change the direction of anti-intellectualism and anti-science, and I think you just offered one possibility. Um, so uh, one of our fellow board members asks, to what extent is the lack of trust between people in government and public institutions contributed to the title of your presentation? lack of trust <clears throat> well it's if, if your focus is i we have to stay in power you know the, the book i was i talked about doing on the civil war um one of the enigmas one of the real paradoxes of that time was robert e lee you know had taken an oath he was uh the commandant of the West Point Academy. He was first in his class. He was he, he signed a pledge to defend the Constitution of the United States and then led the fight to secede from the Union. <clears throat> and his reasoning when pressed was, well, I don't see how the South way of life, how our way of life can actually ever be anything but degradation if we submit to the end of uh, the forced end of slavery, uh, even though he didn't, he himself wasn't a strong proponent of slavery. He was against the forced, um, the forced end of slavery because he thought if it happened too fast, the South wouldn't be able to adjust. So I see that today. I see people on the extreme right who say, "My way of life, golly, we've had." We've had a black president now. We've had twice we've had a black president elected. We have we have gay marriages now that are legal that weren't 20 years ago. We have um, the world I women are, are now almost twice as um, frequent in, in college populations as white males are. 
my white male world is falling apart. I'm desperate. Um, I will do anything uh, to keep those people from getting elected. I, I'm gonna, every time one of them does, it's going to be my job, just like uh, Mitch McConnell said. I've got to make sure they don't get reelected again. That's my job one from now on. So it's and that's where we lost the ability to compromise. It's 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 out of desperation. If if elections they, they see the the majority that white people were going to be a minority in America in the not too distant uh, future, and they were gassed at that possibility. So when you see your way of life and what you think you know is God's way of life being threatened. I'm not going to talk to those people. I'm going to do everything I can to defeat them. Um, and I'm afraid that's what's, what's what I see going on. It's it's one of the roots of that title, anti-science, anti-intellectual. Um, we, we want freedom to be like it was, <laughs> not like it will be. Um, I, I uh, when I first, uh introduce the program. I ask people not to communicate by chat, but we have a, a moment or two left. Uh, I'm, I'm going to entertain their questions that did come in by chat. Um, can a bipartisan approach save us from those who don't have any interest in bipartisanship? I think it's the only approach that we have, we have to find the reasonable people on both sides and have them reforge what that that, that, that ideal ideal of a loyal uh, minority, that is one party is gonna be in power and you have to have the other one there as a check. I'll never forget as long as I live being in China uh, back before uh, the um, Tiananmen Square even, and we having a conversation with uh, graduate students in a, a library at one of the universities over there. And one of these young, young kids or young guys said, you know, we, we see in your country, you have what to us looks like capitalist party A and capitalist party B. You have parties that are pretty much alike on their, their ideology, but they have slightly different views of just how to go about solving problems. Why can't we have, he asked, a communist party A and a communist party B rather than an autocracy, which of course, that kind of thinking and questioning led ultimately to Tiananmen Square, and now much more harsh way of dealing with uh, students over there, I'm afraid. But isn't that an interesting point that, that he would make that observation about us? He saw that we had these two, one serving as a check on the other, and no matter which one was in power, the other served as a loyal, another way of phrasing it, a loyal minority for the time being. And you have to respect them, the ones that are within power, because next time you know they'll be in power and we'll be the loyal minority. We've lost that. It's now all or none. We're going in, we're, gonna, we're going to uh, change uh, voting laws. We're gonna make sure those son of a guns never get in power again. And that's how they look at, that's how we look at one another. And it's too bad, but I sure like to see it come back in some form. It was, it was great growing up at that time even though it was less than perfect. I don't want to mislead uh, in that regard, but much better than now, let's put it that way. Um, uh, back to uh, um, the question and answer group. Uh, there are any number of countries that would like to take our position in the world. How long can we endure and to what extent can the anti-science, anti-intellectual continue before we as Americans are a second rate country? Boy, that's a loaded question. Boy, it is, and I don't have the answer to that, but it's on the way. It's on the way, it's gonna happen. And I'm gonna be very sad when it does. Um, we, we, we win because, you know, we, we, had a, we had a head start. We were the only country that survived World War II with its infrastructure intact. And then we owned the rest of that century and the first part of this one. Uh, we, we had all the scientists from Germany come here and other parts of the world who were looking for opportunity in the sciences, they came here. Uh, it, it, it forged a truly golden age of uh, progress. Um, I remember another time being in, in China when the, uh, one of the university people said, you know what, we, we, we see your country is doing all the innovation. Uh, we can't 
we can't thrive if we don't do that. And he said, you know what the problem is? We teach in our schools, we're still teaching memorization. We, we, we get kids to recite. We, 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 a faculty member will lecture to 500 of them, they take notes and they regurgitate it. All we're, all we're teaching, he said, this was him, not me, uh, making this observation. Over there, you seem to be teaching innovation to, to not just memorize stuff, but to wonder about what could be somehow in your system. Uh, ours still still deter still doing members that well they changed that uh, the next time over there i saw that the party actually announced they were doing what they were going to do uh, i don't know whether do away with but uh, discourage that old form of teaching and try to model what we were doing over here and in in uh, in innovation the, the blend of science research and, and university education here was almost, well, it wasn't unique in the world, but we, we did it better than anybody. Put those two things together. Faculty who were not only imparting knowledge to kids, but showing them how to do it and letting them take, take part in doing it. Uh, might not have been all the students, but they could all see it happening. So they all understood where in innovation comes from. And so I, I think that's at risk now as a scientist guy. Uh, I don't see that being fostered as much as I once did. Um, last question, I promise. Uh, oligarchs and autocrats seem to be the wave of the future. Uh, how do we turn this around? <laughs> By revolutions, I guess. Um, yeah, it's, uh, democracies are, fragile they always are and it's because of this inclination in humans to accept the first story they hear to forge coalitions in which the response to anything coming in from the outside is we don't want anything new we like it just the way it is um we we don't want to have to, to, to uh, think about anything in, in, a, in a new way. And they get comfortable with that. So um, ultimately, an autocrat oversteps his or her uh, bounds. And then there's a revolution because somebody says, I'm not going to live this way anymore and, and throws it over. But the same risk applies to, uh, to democracies. We have to keep and actually improve make ours more of a democracy than it really is. I'd like to see things that other changes I'd like to see would be, let's, let's do away, like somebody suggested yesterday, do away with President's Day and make it Election Day. It's a day off that you have to vote. That's when you vote. And if you don't vote, you, get a, you have a fine. So now you have to inform yourself and get, get into, the, into the game. Uh, <clears throat> and we're not gonna fool with this, uh, trying to disenfranchise voters like apparently is going on now in something like 40 of our states, including this one. <clears throat> with, with including this one and with efforts in our other shared state too. Um, mm -hmm. So the last question, the last question and the burning, the burning interest is what color was the bear? Oh, yeah, the bear, and I'm sure most people got this, the bear had to be white, right? There only, I mean, it's an easy question because there are only two colors of bears, really. <clears throat> well, three, if you want to quibble, but you know, the only place in the world where you can go due south for a mile, then due east for a mile, and then due north for a mile, and get back to the same spot is right at the North Pole. So it had to be white, assuming that that even be white bears up there because it's very cold and dark most of the time. So yeah, the, the white bear for those reasons. Um, Chuck, I want to uh, thank you so much for what wonderful presentation, for sharing your wisdom with us um, and our thanks to you, all the webinar participants who hung in for this whole presentation. Uh, 
Very few uh, left, some may have had to. Um, for your great questions and comments, apologies again for not having gotten to every single one of them. Our next webinar will be on March 10th at 4 p.m. when Dr. Richard Hertzberg will lead a sobering but topical webinar on plastics, the ocean's curse. Please watch for the sign up e-blast as you did for today's webinar. We look forward to your being with us then. And again, thanks, Chuck. Thank you, Ron. Pleasure sharing this with time with you. Likewise. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>